directing and did Pretty in Pink with Howard Dutch, which would be a person he works with for a long time. And of course, this starred Molly Ringwald, but also got John Cryer. It also had Harry Dean Stanton and James Spader. These are big actors that we know nowadays, and sadly, Harry Dean Stanton has passed away. And Pretty in Pink is a movie that I watched for the first time also for this show. And it was kind of a weird watch because I really did enjoy the movie. I like what it was trying to say. I love how the characters were portrayed in here and how it really reflected John Hughes as a person. Because as you guys probably don't know, is uh, John Hughes grew up in like a poor start of town, but he went to this like good high school which is Molly Ringwald's character and he lived on the other side of the tracks and it was fascinating to see that you know and how of course he wanted to fit in and he also wanted to go probably with the hottest girls but again he did it in such a way where it, everything that he was feeling in his heart and what he was writing on the page was also could reflect anyone it doesn't matter about gender or age whatsoever it is all about the character and the psyche of the human person and how he was reflecting that on the pages which is fascinating with John Hughes which I don't see today I don't ever see this done today S still after he has done it and left this earth and it just it's amazing what this guy does Pretty in Pink came out February 28th 1986 that same year the reason he wrote that was because he wanted to direct another movie and that is, of course, Ferris Bueller's Day Off that came out June 11th, 1986. And I got to tell you, this movie is a massive favorite to many people. But for me, it just doesn't really stick with me that much. But after learning about John Hughes's background on this movie and what it represents, it has made me enjoy it more. And what that was is the character of Salone. Salone represent his wife and their connection to him being Ferris, you know. Ferris is this person that's all out and gets all that stuff, you know, and is th this overall guy, which is something that John Hughes wanted to be in school. And he also got the girl of his dreams, Salone, which is his actual wife. And that is mind-blowing how you can put that much meaning and make a beautiful story out of it as well. And again, this movie... It doesn't really hit me that much besides those moments. And rewatching it now, it's like, this is something that I feel like John Hughes would have done, you know, with his friend and his girlfriend that he loves and eventually his wife. It's so fascinating to me in itself, that whole project of writing all this and having that much meaning. We don't see that ever. I swear we don't ever, even the, some of my favorite movies of all time, we do not see that. Which is crazy in itself, you know? Um, it's so fascinating. We mainly see it from actors, you know? We always see them pull from their past and how they react to things and all that. But we never really see it done in writing. And John Hughes does that. That is fascinating. It's super fascinating. As we continue, we'll kind of see a pattern of John Hughes writing something and directing something. It's always that, and you kind of see that in the same year, which that means this guy was working every year twice. It was so fascinating. And the thing with John Hughes' writing in itself is he would write something, he would come on the first day of shooting, and then he would leave for the whole shoot, and then come back at the end. He was just like, he just didn't want to meddle with it or anything. He was always kind of keeping to himself and doing his own things at the same time he was working hard but he was also this very fascinating human being and what I mean by that is he kind of had a routine to how he worked where if you would have a meeting with someone he would always have his assistant bring a brand new pack of cigarettes in and he would basically smoke it as soon as he got in there and sat down at his desk that is fascinating that is a person that has a routine because he is working so hard and yeah you could be like he's full of himself he does that I don't think that I feel like it's a fascinating trait to have you don't just say hey I need a new pack of cigarettes and he smoked a lot and so did his friend John Candy um, and we saw that routine quite a bit but his next project was some kind of wonderful with director Howie Dutch which he would return 
which I told you. And this movie was the most fascinating to me and the one that was by far one of my favorites of the new watches that I've ever seen of John Hughes' movies. This movie was so, so good. I love the meaning. I love the soundtrack. And again, this one doesn't really feel like it has that John Hughes of himself, I should say. It has the John Hughes feel in the script, but it doesn't have the John Hughes, John Hughes in the script, if that makes sense. But this movie was fascinating itself because it was really, really lighthearted. But of course, it started the whole marriage of Howard Dutch and Leah Thompson getting married and having a kid, which she's a great actress as well. She's been in movies like Edge of 17 and all that, which also represent the movies of John Hughes, which is fascinating in itself. But they were really close, John Hughes and Howard Dutch. They worked on a lot of movies together, and this was not an exception. But what this movie did well is the relationships, and the scenes are memorable, and I love all the characters. And Eric Stoltz is really good as well, which I've never seen him in a movie. I knew who he was, though, because of Back to the Future. And it's just a good, lighthearted movie, you know? And... Sometimes we need a break from these hard-hitting John Hughes movies, um, even though you can say that none of them are that way. Um, but I definitely think the next one he does is one of those hard-hitting ones. So John Hughes's next movies would be the most personal to him and to his story. And the first one of those is Plane, Trains, and Automobiles. Since every single one of the movies we have talked about have been more of the side of kiddish and the teen thing, which he felt like was a would even criticize him doing this whole thing over and over again and tend to not like his movies, but Roger Ebert always liked their movies and found the really gold in them. So he felt like, screw you guys, I'm going to make these high-class movies that deal with my problems. And that is, of course, Plane, Trains, and Automobiles came out November 25th, 1987. This stars John Candy and Steve Martin as this awful duo always constantly fighting but it also finds the heart in this movie this is purely a story on john hughes experience what i mentioned at the beginning of this episode where he would have to leave for chicago to go la but of course it's new york and so technically that's what this is and because he had the kind of same experience from going to place to place he would have to kind of have these troubles of stuff happening so that's kind of how he wrote the script of plane trades of automobiles but when he wrote it was actually fascinating in itself it was a snowstorm and he couldn't do anything else and he sat down and thought of that memory and he wrote plane trains and automobiles which was fascinating in itself and of course john candy was in mind when he was doing it so it had a kind of big part of his life in that sense but also this created this very very great relationship with John Candy and John Hughes. This relationship would be massive for John Hughes because John Hughes was notorious for staying up all night, working at night, and writing scripts, even calling people super late at night to talk about the movie scripts that he was writing. And when he would start to try to fix someone at his house, he would write another script. And that's how Ferris Bueller came out when they were working on Some Kind of Wonderful. But this movie was really, really, really fascinating because it gave John Candy the voice that people wanted to see and felt like they needed to see. To see John Candy in this serious role and kill it. Even till this damn day, the legacy that this amazing actor has done, John Candy, thinks that this is his best performance. Everyone has said it. And would I disagree? No, but I love John Candy as an actor, and I love everything he does. But this was a massive, massive thing for John Candy as an actor, and blew him up, and you felt for him. And that's why this is probably one of the most rewatchable of John Hughes movies for me, because it's very a fascinating movie. Then comes the downfall of John Hughes. After this movie that I'm about to talk about is where John Hughes kind of distanced himself from Hollywood and wanted to go more different routes and this is where it broke him because he's had some problems in the past with working all these movies in the past even to the point where Molly Ringwald and Anthony Michael Hall they all had a fallen out at this time 
and they were like, I don't want to be known as the John Hughes girl on all these teen rom-coms. So she went away and so did Anthony Michael Hall. And he was hurt. And, of course, the Mr. Mom thing. A lot of things fell into this. But then came his most personal film ever. And that is, she's having a baby, and it came out February 5th, 1988. This is literally a biography of John Hughes. It is. You can disagree all you want, but it literally is. Because, like I said, the story from Mr. Mom, which is about his kid and his wife, uh, which happens, and he has a kid and his wife, and that's what she's having a baby is. And we see John Hughes in this movie. Yeah, it's a weird movie. Did I love it that much? Not really. But do I want to rewatch it after learning all about this? Hell damn yes. And I wouldn't be surprised if it becomes one of my favorites because this is the most personal John Hughes movie you can get. Because it is about his life. And it's about his wife. It's literally about everything that you read about John Hughes is, is in this damn movie. This movie, of course, bombed. No one really liked it. It got panned. It broke John Hughes. He was sad, depressed. Didn't want to work on any movies anymore. He was just kind of done. And this is where you kind of see him leave the directing thing. He does one more movie after this. But after that, he's gone. You never see him in the directing role after this movie. He was heartbroken. And that's why I feel like this is the downfall of John Hughes. Meaning that this is where he kind of just left Hollywood. Not that John Hughes lives on forever. Especially in this video. This is why I'm doing it. Because he means so much to me. And I'm sure people watching this or new fans of John Hughes will respect him even more. So if you guys haven't checked out She's Having a Baby and you're fascinated with John Hughes, please do. This is the most personal thing about him you can get. And that's why I want to rewatch it. Then came The Great Outdoors with his friend John Candy. And then you got Dan Aykroyd in this movie. A lot of people don't think this movie holds up. I like it a lot. Good soundtrack and definitely feels John Hughes. Uh, this movie this movie came out June 17th, 1988, the same year as She's Having a Baby. Uh, there's not much you can really say about this movie. I enjoyed it. I feel John Hughes in it. I feel the characters in it. I feel like John Candy is represented very well in this movie. And plus, it gave him his first leading role in a movie, so that was great to see. Then John Hughes was back to direct, and that was Uncle Buck, August 16th, 1989, which of course stars John Candy in a leading role with a young Macaulay Colton, which he'll eventually return in John Hughes' filmography. This movie is a great, great, great watch. And I love it. And I think it's funny as hell. I think it's brilliant. And that's the thing what John Hughes does. You know, it's about a person that doesn't grow up. You know, he's still this kid. Uh, and he, you definitely see that. And it's about him growing up. So it's a serious matter but done with comedy. And that's what you see in every single one of these movies. The only one that doesn't have comedy, though, is she's having a baby. Which also brings back to my point of this is where the downfall is. And you kind of see him doing more serious stuff after this. Uh, not writing-wise, but after Uncle Buck, he goes into the serious route of directing and writing again. And I feel like he was really hurt by what happened with him during She's Having a Baby. So after European Vacation, like I said, he felt awful about it. He did not think it was the best script. So he wanted to redeem himself, and he felt bad for it. So he wrote the classic, the greatest Christmas movie of all time, Christmas Vacation. Carl Griswold and Beverly D'Angelo back. And this movie is so funny. It is great. There is no meaning of John Hughes in this movie. I feel like he did take some of it, though, because you kind of see it represents everyone. So it represents the whole thing of Christmas, um, which is just fascinating i also definitely want to say that Clark griswold's character is always trying to make some people happy and john hughes did that he really cared about his kids he really really do loves the relationship he has that's why chicago is so important to him that's where he led for his entire life until he moved to los angeles for like a year to work on movies because he was so far away but that's the thing and she's having a baby you kind of see him fantasize of him cheating on his wife and you see that countless times in the vacation thing so I feel like it's kind of there it's kind of there he never does it but it's always there that's what she's having a baby represents as well so I feel like 
he's still living that on. But he wanted to make it back to National Lampoon, and of course he did, because this is one of the greatest movies of all time for many people, and it's one of, is the greatest Christmas movie, and there is no debate for me on that one. So then it created a beautiful relationship between director and writer, and that is, of course, Home Alone, November 16th, 1990. What's fascinating about this movie, what's fascinating about this movie is the story of how it came to be. John Hughes wrote the script for Home Alone, and he saw Adventures in Babysitting, which was Christopher Columbus's first directed movie. He loved it. He wanted to give him something to do with one of his scripts because he believed in this guy. And he directed another movie, Christopher Columbus, and he kind of flopped. That movie bombed, and he was afraid of his career happening. He felt like he would have to move back home, and he had to quit. But John Hughes sent him two scripts, and one of them was, of course, Home Alone, and that started the relationship with them. Christopher Columbus becoming one of the biggest directors of all time because of, like, Harry Potter. But this would not have happened if it wasn't for John Hughes. He will admit that himself. Uh, in the book I read, there is a foreword by him admitting that. Home Alone is, of course, a classic, another Christmas classic, and also tells another story that he had as a child. He got left alone and... This is his story, and that's super fascinating because it's all about him, and it's all represented here. It is so fascinating as a person to have all these stories and write them down on paper. But again, I feel like Home Alone is more of a story of Christopher Columbus. and But again, there is the story of John Candy showing up there, and of course, John Hughes never showed up on set besides the first and last day, but he showed up for John Candy's shoot where he shot all his scenes at once. So again, he wrote another script called Career Opportunities, which came out March 29th, 1991, and of course stars a young Jennifer Connelly. This movie's not special, but again, of course, because John Hughes was a big fan and friend of John Candy, he showed up and had a little cameo in this movie. Again, I have seen this movie twice. I enjoy it for what it is. It's nothing special, but I definitely get John Hughes' there, you know? Having that moment to talk to the popular girl that you've always had a crush on that never knew who you were and being locked in a certain place to have a conversation and probably fall in love. I feel like it's a fascination, you know, but I also feel like it's telling a story of him and his wife again. And I feel like every one of these girl characters are a representation of his wife. Then there's another movie called Dutch, which many people don't know about, which came out July 19th, 1991. This movie's about this guy that's uh, dating this girl that has a kid. And uh, the wife has been divorced and he's bringing him back for Thanksgiving so they can have a relationship of some sort and how that all goes bad. Um, I don't think this has any relation to John Hughes whatsoever. As far as I know, it's not really big on his radar. Um, but again, it was a fascinating little watch. But again, this is where I feel like John Hughes was losing it. There's nothing really there to grab onto in this movie. Then came his last directed movie, Curly Sue, October 25th, 1991. A great little watch of a movie uh, represents this like porn and perceptions of people. And that was fascinating in itself. And I feel like this was a representation of John Hughes because of how he saw everyone. It was, everyone was equal and everyone had the same feelings as him. And it all meant something to him. And I feel like it was represented in this movie very well. This movie was on the serious side. Yeah, it had some comedy bits, but it was on the serious side. And I really did enjoy that. But again, like I said, John Hughes kind of left Hollywood after she's having a baby. And you can kind of see that with the rest of these movies. Because Home Alone was probably written a long time ago. And it's fascinating how a guy could take this a lot and just really take it to heart. Then... The last on this episode of the A-List is Home Alone 2, November 20th, 1992. This was a movie that a lot of people think is a rehash. Yes, but it's different. Even Christopher Columbus saying that he enjoys the second one better than the first one because it feels like it's more fleshed out and there's more set pieces and there's all this stuff. Um, But John Hughes wrote this one and he did a good job. And again, it has that meaning kind of the same meaning of perceptions of people on home alone too so it's kind of all there at the same time but after this movie john hughes was hurt again and 
John Hughes was hurt because he wanted to make so many movies with Christopher Columbus because they worked so well together. But he left to go make Mrs. Doubtfire. You're like, yeah, he made Mrs. Doubtfire. But honestly, John Hughes was hurt by that. He felt like they were friends. And yeah, you could be like, John Hughes needs to say that it's fine. He needs to go do his job too, you know. But again, he was hurt. And John Hughes was in that moment of hurting really bad because she's having a baby. And it's just heartbreaking. And now we have concluded the list of the all the way up to 1992 movies of John Hughes. Like I said, if you guys want to know more about John Hughes and let me do the rest, then definitely let me know in the comment sections below. But here's the thing, guys. John Hughes's all their movies, I came to the conclusion they all represent one thing. Reflection. Any one of these movies has reflection in it. Okay? Think about it. You have the characters of Plane, Trains, and Automobiles where they're reflecting on their lives currently and relating them to current. In the vacation movies, you have Chris um, Griswold fantasizing about uh, him having an affair or any of that, which is also reflected in She's Having a Baby, which is also reflecting on his past of what could have been and uh, I want to be young and all that. And Home Alone, reflecting on uh, wanting my parents here. You know, it's... All these movies have a sense of reflection in it. And I feel like that was John Hughes's life. He was always reflecting back to his childhood and all these memories he had. And he was trying to make it in person. But he was also bringing about the bad things from the childhood and reflecting them and giving them to people so they can learn and grow. I don't know if you guys are religious people watching on this, but I feel like John Hughes, I feel like John Hughes was put on this earth to tell these stories and make people feel okay about themselves and the problems they're going with that is normal and I feel like John Hughes was meant to be here for the time he was and I'm this sounds awful but I I'm kind of glad John Hughes got a nice death he wasn't so old and even though he had a heart attack because of all the stress he was building up for over the years and all the cigarettes he smoked was also a contributor in it as well I feel like he was born as a kid, you know, and like the Billy Joel song says, only the good die young. And I really believe that to be true about John Hughes. And John Hughes was also a massive music movie. So if you see any things from the movies, they're all really good soundtracks because John Hughes handpicked them from England because he was a massive fan of England, even going on a trip later on. Uh, if we get to a part two of this episode um, to go down that rabbit hole of him in England and all that but he was also a massive fan of music in itself so John Hughes by any means was the most most amazing guy and even though yeah I'm not I'm going to talk about it a little bit here saying that he was kind of rude on set to people but again he was burnt and we just say is that okay if he was burnt to be rude to people no it isn't but I understand why he was and at the same time, John Candy passed away as well. John Candy, uh, he was told he was working on a uh, movie at the time. And they were going to go work on writing it. And uh, they stopped because John Candy died. But John Candy was his best friend. He would stay up late writing the scripts and talking over the phone and writing all these scripts. So it really broke him hard when he passed away. Um, but I've never heard anything said by John Hughes about John Candy's death. I only read it for someone else's point of view from the book. So it's just heartbreaking. This guy's story is so fascinating. And if, if you guys are going to take anything from them, I want you to look at these movies in a different way now, knowing the background of these and even Mr. Mom. But also I want you to look at it at the sign of reflection. Each one of these movies has a sense of reflection. But also I strongly recommend you to watch She's Having a Baby because it's basically a biopic about John Hughes so I will definitely recommend that one but guys if you're actually curious about the book I read that I mentioned quite a bit in here it is John Hughes a life in film it is so good it is so so good that you guys should definitely check out also if you guys are fascinated about a documentary about John Hughes and the love that people have for him uh, don't you forget about me you can buy it on Amazon for like six bucks it's a DVD that's the only way you can watch it if you're curious about it I watched it for this um, episode as well. Uh, but guys, please subscribe to Guideline Entertainment. I put a lot, a lot of time on this. It took me over two months to get through. It was a long process.
process, but I love doing it. I love doing it. I'll probably go more deep into people I find out and try to find books about them because it's so fascinating in itself. So uh, please like and subscribe to the channel. Uh, comment if you want to see a part two with his most current movies because I know I miss Baby's Day Out, Flubber, all those movies. If you guys care about that stuff, let me know. I can do it. I don't mind doing it, but I just didn't want to. This is all a long video in itself already. So um, I want to thank you guys for watching. I'll see you guys next time. Goodbye.